So today, let us read from this passage, Gadhada 173. Can you believe we read 73 passages so far? Conquering lust, becoming free of worldly desires. This is true in Hinduism as it's true in all religions, that to really be joyful, we have to conquer our own lust to take anything from anyone. We must become free of desire to attain anything in the world. On the night of Chaitra Vadhi Amas, Samvat 1876, which is the 12th of April, 1820, in our Julian calendar, Swami Sri Sahajanand Ji Maharaj, who was a great spiritual being, was sitting on the veranda outside the north-facing room of his residence in Dadag Hachars Darbar in Gathada. He was wearing a white case and had covered himself with a white cotton cloth. He had also tied a white feto around his head. At that time, four senior sadhus, including Muktanand Swami, along with some fifty other devotees, had gathered before him. Then, Gopalanand Swami asked, What is the nature of lust? Solid question. Sriji Maharaj answered, The vital fluid within someone that converts itself into a human being, for us men it's our seed, for us women it's our ovum, our egg. Interesting. Thereupon, Gopalanand Swami raised a doubt. This vital constituent is one of the seven basic parts of the body. How then can it alone be called the nature of lust? Also, how exactly is that produced? Sriji Maharaj explained, the mind resides in the Manovaha Nadi. Nadi means river. Here we're talking about a river of, uh, of consciousness. Whenever a thought related to someone you're attracted to arises in the mind, the vital fluid is churned within the body. And after collecting the Manovaha Nadi, this river of consciousness where the mind resides, it is discharged through the organs of procreation. I'm taking some liberty to interpret this for the case of respecting TikTok's <laughs> live stream <laughs> policies and for the sake of a Western audience that might be unfamiliar with, with uh, this language. By the way, we talked about the, the seven basic constituents of the body. The other six are Rakta, which is blood, Mans, muscle, maid, fat, ashti, bones, majja, marrow, and uh, ras, which is just general bodily fluids. So, when we feel attracted towards some, there is a kind of movement that happens in our vital fluids. Just as ghee clarified butter surfaces from yogurt when it is churned, by a turning rod. One whose vital fluids is not discharged through the organs of procreation is known as an urdvareta, literally someone who retains these vital fluids, and a perfect brahmachari. We were talking about brahmachari earlier. A brahmachari means someone who practices brahmacharya which means exactly this. They are converting the, the sexual energy, the vital fluids, into something even higher. When Sri Krishna Bhagwan whoop, associated with the gopis, who were uh, his milkmaidens, during the Ras episode, 
he did not allow for the discharge of the vital fluid. For this reason, he was known as an Urvoreta Brahmachari and had thus conquered lust. Therefore, the vital fluid alone is the nature of lust. One who has conquered the vital fluid has conquered lust. It's very interesting. Gopalanand Swami asked again, when the body is burnt after death, its seven constituents are burnt along with it. Therefore, if vital fluid is alone the nature of lust, then surely by the burning of the vital fluid along with the body, lust should also be burnt. Why then does lust arise when the jiva, the soul, enters another body? Sri Ji Maharaj replied, the vital fluid is retained in the sukshma body. Moreover, it is because of the sukshma body that the stool body is produced. These are the subtle body, which is something that pervades the physical body. It's the body that you have in dream. Because even if your eyes are closed, your physical eyes are not seeing, but you still have vision in your dream. So there's an element of all of the senses, including the sensual organs that exist in the mind, not just the body. When a ghost, which is mainly composed of a sukshma body, a subtle body, from its own sukshma body, enters into the stool body, the subtle body enters the physical body of another person and associates with someone they're attracted to, that person they're attracted to conceives a child with the help of you by that ghost. I've never heard of this. That's a concept. Wow. That we are able to produce another soul through procreation because a subtle body has entered you both. Gopalanand Swami questioned further. Shivaji, which is a form of the divine, the destroyer of the trinity in Hinduism, was an urdvareta, someone who retained the, the sexual energies. Yet, upon seeing Mohini, some vital energy was discharged. This implies that as long as there is this vital fluid in the body, it is sure to be discharged whenever one associates with someone they're attracted to in the waking or dream state. So then, as long as there is vital fluid in the body, how can one be called a perfect brahmachari? Sri Ji Maharaj explained, that can be said to be a fault in Shivaji's yogic powers. A person whose vital fluids are discharged in the waking or dream state by the thought of something they're attracted to cannot be called a staunch brahmachari. That is why in this whole world, Nar Narayan or Rishi is the only one who has firm brahmacharya, who is the, uh, the form of the divine that this tradition associates with. Since we have accepted the refuge of that Nar Narayan Rishi, by his grace we shall also gradually become perfect brahmacharis like him, just by worshipping him. Yogis endeavor in many ways to burn the vital fluid which remains in the body. Sri Krishna Bhagwan, however, maintained perfect brahmacharya even amidst the company of those he found attractive. Such powers are only present in the divine. No one else is capable of remaining uninfluenced like that. Therefore, other yogis should endeavor to avoid thinking of attracting figures in both the waking state and in the dream state. Shukamuni then asked, In Dwarika, Sri Krishna Bhagwan had 16,108 wives. It is said that he had 10 sons and one daughter by each wife. How should one understand this? Sri Ji Maharaj clarified, 
The incidents of Dwarika are one thing, and the incidents of Raj are another. In Dwarika, Sri Krishna Bhagwan had adopted the principle of Sankhya, which is one of the, the six schools of Indian philosophy. A follower of the Sankhya principle believes their own self to be distinct from the mind, body, and indriyas, the sense organs. While performing all actions, they do not regard themselves as being the doer of those actions, nor do they experience either joy or grief from those actions. That was the principle adopted by Sri Krishna Bhagwan there. Therefore, he was said to be uninfluenced. The Sankhya principle adopted by Sri Krishna Bhagwan in Dwarika is the very same Sankhya principle observed by great majesties such as Janaka, who was a great king in, in the Hindu culture many thousands of years ago, who worshipped God as householders. In the same way, Sri Krishna Bhagwan was also a householder and was known as the king of Dwarika. Therefore, because he followed the Sankhya principle, he remained uninfluenced as well. In Vrindavan, however, Sri Krishna Bhagwan had adopted the principle of yoga, by which he maintained his vow of perfect brahmacharya, despite associating with those he found attractive. So, yoga is also technically one of the other six of uh, the school, yeah, one of the six schools of, of Indian philosophy, classically. And Sri Krishna Bhagwan represents the divine. So there's a subtle reasoning here, which is beautiful. I just want to point out as well, which is that uh, the divine adopts different philosophies at different places and different times. And this is one such very direct example of that. At that time, he displayed the powers of Nar Narayan Rishi within himself. In the Srimad Bhagavat, which is a famous story, a Purana, Kapil Dev explains to Devhuti, No one except Nar Narayan Rishi is capable of overcoming my Maya, my material existence, in the form of those whom they find attractive. But Sri Krishna Bhagwan conquered lust while associating with them. Now consider the following incident. When Durvasa Rishi came and Sri Krishna Bhagwan began sending all of the gopis with dishes filled with food for him, the gopis asked, how shall we cross the Yamunaji River? The Yamunaji, the Yamunaji River. At that time, Sri Krishna Bhagwan said, Tell Yamunaji that if Sri Krishna is forever a brahmachari, then make way for us. <laughs> when the gopis told this to Yamunaji, it made way for them. After feeding the rishis, all of the gopis asked him, The Yamunaji is, on, is in our way. How shall we return home? The rishi then asked, how did you come? The gopis explained, We told Yamunaji that if Sri Krishna is forever a brahmachari, then make way for us. So it made way for us. But how shall we return home now? Durvasa Rishi then said, Tell Yamunaji that if Durvasa Rishi is forever fasting, then make way for us. Thereafter, when the gopis said this to Yamunaji, it made way for them. Seeing this, the gopis were extremely surprised. However, they were unable to realize the glory of Sri Krishna Bhagwan or the Rishi. Sri Krishna Bhagwan played with the gopis while maintaining his vow of perfect brahmacharya and was therefore still a brahmachari. Durvasa Rishi also united his atma, his true self, with Sri Krishna Bhagwan, the atma of all, the self of all beings. And although he ate all of the food offered by the gopis, he was still forever fasting, because in reality he had fed all of the food to the divine. Thus, the actions of the extremely great cannot be comprehended. If one looks for followers of the Sankhya principle, 
one could find thousands. However, to be an Ur Urdvoreta by way of yogic powers is only possible for Nara Narayan. In addition, a true devotee of Nara Narayan can also gradually develop firm brahmacharya by the power of their worship, but others cannot. Furthermore, if vital fluid is discharged through the, the organs of procreation in the waking or dream state, one cannot be called a brahmachari. Nevertheless, a person who observes eightfold renunciation of those whom they are attracted to is walking on the path of brahmacharya. So with time, by the grace of Nara Narayan, they will gradually become a firm brahmachari. This is a, this is a, a longer passage today. When I was young, I had heard that the vital fluid is also released through one sweat. So in order to retain my vital fluid, I learned two types of jalbasti and also kunjar kriya, which I assume are ways to keep yourself cool. <laughs> in order to conquer lust, I learned many yogic asanas, postures as well. When I slept at night, I slept in the posture of Gorak asan to prevent the discharge of vital fluid even in the dream state. To conquer lust I endeavored so vigorously that my body stopped sweating and I no longer felt either cold or the heat. Then when I came to Ramanand Swami, he tried to make me sweat by pasting ava leaves all over my body. Even then my body would not sweat. So conquering lust is the most difficult of all spiritual endeavors. Nevertheless, a person who has the firm strength of the upasana, the worship of the divine, have become absolutely free from desires for vishais, experiences of the senses, and is firmly resolute in remaining free of worldly desires, becoming free of lust by the grace of the divine. And that's a good question, G2 Infinity. Maybe we can pause for a second to answer this. You share it's confusing. How can one be a brahmacharya and be married then? One that follows this practice seems to be single. There are two ways of following it. One, if you are a sannyasi, which means a renunciant, you, are a, you, are, you live a monastic life. For those who live a monastic life, then indeed they are single. But the other kind of spiritual seeker is one who still lives with, like the rest, they are a householder, a grihasi, and a grihasi, grihasi may be married, but uh, they have a radically different perception of their significant other than many people have with their significant other in our culture. Unfortunately, many people look at their significant other as, as, as a source of gratification that they just can't wait to be able to extract some pleasure from them. And of course, there is a beautiful bonding that happens during these times, no doubt. It's also one form of expression of love, but there are even deeper and more intimate forms of love. And I think not many people have explored this possibility, but for a brahmachari who is also a householder, someone who may be married even, they are constantly exploring ways to, to have a love with their significant other that's so much farther than, than just what can be experienced by the body alone. In other words, a man looks at, uh, at their significant other. Let's say it's a man and woman. The man looks at the woman with, with a kind of reverence. There's just the divine feminine in front of them. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are a man or a woman. If you have the feminine in front of you, then see that as the divine feminine. And if you have the masculine in front of you, then see that as the divine masculine. The goal for brahmachari householders is to see each other as a form of the divine. Thus, we literally do our puja, our reverence at each other's feet. For example, Ramakrishna Paramahansa, who 
indeed had a significant other. Whenever he wanted to worship his Ishta Devata Kali, he would go to her and he would touch her feet and he would literally meditate in front of her because her was, she was the divine to him. And so he meditated on her and uh, that is a kind of intimacy that, that is so precious, you know. That, that instead of wanting to, to, uh, to touch you physically, you know, I want to sit across from you and meditate on my love for you. I want to, to just hold your form in my mind and appreciate you as the divine. So that, it, that is the way which brahmacharya works for, for householders. I hope that maybe clears some confusion. Mind you, it's a very difficult thing to practice, of course. <laughs> I continue. Thereafter, Nityanand Swami asked, What is the method of becoming free of worldly desires? It's the second part of this passage now. Is it through listening to such talks or is it vairagya? Vairagya means dispassion, specifically for worldly things. Sriji Maharaj replied, Vairagya alone cannot last. Ultimately, it is destroyed. It's no doubt that as we become more aware of ourselves and others, we see a growing sense of suffering in the world. We become very much displeased with the world in this sense. So we kind of make a cocoon for ourselves with dispassion towards the world. But eventually we emerge from that cocoon and we have love for the world the same as it's dissolved because the world too is an expression of, of something higher. Therefore, after developing knowledge of the Atma, the true self, and through jnana, through uh, knowledge wisdom of divine form, one should think, I am the Atma, the true self, characterized by eternal existence, consciousness and bliss, Sat Chit Ananda. Whereas the body and the Brahmanand, even the whole universe, are mayak, material and perishable. Everything in this world comes and it goes. How can they compare to me as the true self? which cannot be that which perishes. Moreover, my Ishta Dev, the personal form of the divine, is Purushottam Bhagwan, the all-high and the all-personal, who transcends even Akshar, the supporter of countless millions of Brahmanans' universes. I have firm refuge of that source. Vairagya, cultivated from such thoughts is said to be compounded with gyan, with knowledge. It is this vairagya that is never destroyed. For example, a burning flame is extinguished when water is poured over it. However, the vadvanal fire that rests in the ocean cannot be extinguished even by the waters of the ocean itself. Similarly, vairagya compounded with jnana is like the vadvanal fire and without and sorry and the fire of lightning it is inextinguishable without that gyan that knowledge though other forms of vairagya cannot be trusted my vaya, my vairagya is like that of the fire of lightning and the vadvanal fire this nature of mine is known by those who have stayed extremely close to me. However, those who remain far from me are unable to realize my nature. Furthermore, this Mulji Brahmachari may appear to be naive, yet they thoroughly know my nature. Realizing Maharaj is as aloof as Akash as space, he has no prejudices against or in favor of anyone. Because they know my nature as being so, they possess virtues like those of the Divine. 
Moreover, the Antaryami, the indweller of everyone, the divine residing within all, explains to the minds of all such people, there is no fault whatsoever in this Brahmachari. The means of acquiring such virtuous qualities are as follows. Whoever believes the great Purush, person, to be absolutely free of flaws becomes totally flawless themselves. If, however, a person perceives flaws in the great Purush, person, that person's intellect becomes polluted, and enemies like lust, anger, etc. all come to dwell within their heart. As a result, the heart of that person who perceives fault in the Sat Purush, in the true person, is gravely troubled by disturbing thoughts. Although they may practice satsang, associating with spiritual people, they never ceases to be unhappy. Those who are wise realize all my characteristics by staying close to me. They realize Maharaj has no affection for any object in this world that can arouse infatuation. Wealth, people, ornaments, food and drink, etc. In fact, Maharaj remains dejected from all these things. When, out of compassion, they allow some person to sit near them or talks to them of jnana, of knowledge, it is purely out of compassion for the liberation of the jiva. On the other hand, those who are goofballs, whether they stay near or far, cannot understand my nature as such. These discourses can only be understood by a person who has Atma realization, self realization, who, beholding the form of the divine within their Atma, their self, offers bhakti, loving devotion to the divine, and who does not forsake the worship of the divine even after becoming Brahmarup. And this is a subtle point too, that uh, enlightenment isn't the end of of uh, bhakti. Some say that it actually begins there, that once you enter into a space of, of unabiding or unending peace, joy, that's when your love really ignites. Therefore, after developing Atma realization, self-realization, and understanding the glory of the divine form, no desire for any object remains. Once worldly desires are eradicated, a person may experience pain and pleasures according to the prarabdha of their body, their, uh, their destiny, but the indriyas, the senses, no longer remain sharp. The indriyas are the spokes of the manomaya chakra. They become blunt only by the complete realization of Brahman, the ultimate reality, and Parabrahman, who transcends Brahman. For example, if a person whose teeth have become very sensitive as a result of sucking lamens <laughs> has to chew some chana, lentils, they could never chew them. If they were extremely hungry, they would at most swallow them, but they would be unable to chew them. Similarly, a person who has thoroughly realized the glory of the Divine and the Atma, the true Self, feels no joy whatsoever in any of the pleasures of the Vishais, the sensual experiences of any realm, even in heaven. While the prarabdha, the, uh, the birthright of the body persists, they may indulge in food, drink, and other objects, but they would do so in the manner of a person with sensitized teeth swallowing whole chana. To eradicate worldly desires, however, indeed is an extremely difficult task. In fact, they remain even after mastering samadhi, which is a state of consciousness that appears in meditation. After attaining samadhi, there is no way a person can return from the form of Brahman 
the ultimate reality back into their body. Yet, if they do return, it is because of one of three reasons. Firstly, they return to their body from samadhi if they harbor desire for worldly pleasures. Or, if someone is extremely powerful, they can enter into samadhi and return to the body according to their own will. Lastly, if there is another person who is much more powerful than oneself, then that person can bring one back into the body from samadhi. There are three ways of returning to the body from samadhi, and those are them. When samadhi occurs, a person has the darshan, the presence, the divine witnessing of Brahman, the ultimate reality, and sees the divine light of Brahman to be like that of countless millions of suns. If at that time that person does not have much understanding, they regard the form of the manifest Purushottam Bhagwan to be inferior and believes Brahman to be superior, thereby committing a breach of upasana, of having reverence. That is why firm faith should be developed in the manifest form, because only then can all things be accomplished. I have also firmly resolved that in anyone who sincerely surrenders their mind unto me and does not allow even the slightest barrier to remain between us, I shall not allow any flaw whatsoever to remain. That is the power of a, a spiritual teacher such as the speaker here. Sorry, not me, the speaker, the speaker in the book. <laughs> Thereupon Muktanand Swami asked, What are the characteristics of a person who has surrendered their mind? And what are the characteristics of a person who has not surrendered their mind? Sriji Maharaj replied, If a person who has surrendered their mind to the divine is unable to be present while the talks of the divine are in progress, or for the darshan, the divine witness presence, of the divine, they experience intense remorse in their heart. Whenever they listen to the talks of the divine and do the darshan of the divine, their love for the divine continuously increases, but never does their mind recede from those talks and darshan. Moreover, when the divine gives a command to someone to stay far away, a person who has surrendered their mind would think to themselves, if that command were given to me, I would gladly go to Boranpur or Kashi or anywhere else for that matter. A person who remains happy living according to the wishes of the divine in this way is near to me, even if they are a thousand miles away. Last paragraph. On the other hand, a person who has not surrendered their mind in this way is as good as being hundreds of thousands of miles away, even though they may be staying very close to me. In fact, I am afraid of giving advice to a person who has not surrendered their mind to me, as I fear, will they accept it positively or adversely? These are the characteristics of a person who has not surrendered their mind and of a person who has not, who has and who has not. <laughs> okay. Wow, that was a long one, hey? That's okay. I'm always happy to read these with you. So thank you for listening.